So, compression. So we looked at how you do, uh, you know, we looked at two applications of using uh, motion vectors uh, to do video processing. Uh, so we looked at denoising and we looked at uh, frame rate uh, conversions, so be able to uh, create in between frames. So now we're looking to look at uh, video compression. Okay. So in this graph, what you have here is uh, if you look at the Caltrain sequence, so the, the sequence with that um, that mobile, that calendar moving and the, the train moving. Um, what we have plotted here is the, uh, the number of frames, oh, sorry, the frame ID. And on the Y axis, you have the actual entropy uh, for that frame uh, in the DCT uh, domain, okay? So uh, basically what we're trying to do here is to apply JPEG compression on every single frame and um, the, the, the entropy here is a proxy to get, give us an idea of what the actual size would be. Uh, so we looked at each frame, we split that into blocks of um, eight by eight, and we compute the DCT. We apply the uh, quantization step of 15 for all bands, and uh, we look back at what we get, and we just uh, uh, get the, uh, report the entropy. So we can see the entropy is uh, uh, fairly standard, so we get 2.5 um, bits per pixel, uh, which is you know standard of JPEG. Okay, obviously we know that's not necessarily um, we can do better because there is no temporal. We don't exploit the temporal um, redundancy at all here, and so what we need to do is to do um, to look at the, the fact that two consecutive frames are probably mostly identical. So in fact, this is what we see here. So, um, so on the top, you have one frame. On the bottom here, uh, what you get is a frame difference. So not the, the motion composite difference, just the frame difference. And as you've seen for, remember if you draw the ha or the, 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 the difference um, uh, uh, transform, um, <clears throat> here we, we, we see that mostly you have um, no motion and you only detect um, differences uh, where there is motion, but only motion at the boundaries, okay? So most of the time, actually, the pixels stay the same intensity uh, even when you're in presence of motion, okay? So that is interesting because, you know, looking back at the histogram, so this is the histogram of your original frame. So you have a nice spread over all the uh, spectrum, and you know, it's something we are used to uh, for natural images. So you have uh, entropy of around eight bits. Um, but when you start doing the frame difference, um, then the, you have an Instagram which is, uh, has you know, a stronger peak. Um, so, okay, you have to squint your eyes here, but the, the numbers here are quite different, okay, because you do a subtraction between two values. So it's a bit like the heart transform, the scale is, uh, is bigger. Now you, it goes from, you know, 255 to minus 255 here, okay? Anyway, so the entropy uh, drops a bit, uh, goes to 6.1, and that's all fine. Um, so this is our <clears throat> a video compression model 2.0. So we, we say, right, we can, we can be smarter. Now, the way I'm going to work is I encode the first frame, so that'll be this one, using JPEG. Uh, so the entropy is still 2.5, but then afterwards, the only thing I do is I compute the difference between the two frames and do the JPEG encoding on that difference and uh, hope that everything is fine, right? So doing the JPEG encoding of the difference is interesting because, you know, we can see that the entropy is uh, significantly lower. Now it's not massive, okay, it's just a bit lower, right? But still, just by looking at the frame difference uh, and encoding that as JPEG, uh, you see that you can, you can go somewhere. Now, we can go further. We can look at um, motion estimation. And then we can compare here 
um, the actually displaced frame difference. Okay, so the top you have the histogram of the um, frame difference, and you have an entropy of 6.1 bits per pixel. And here you have the histogram of the displaced frame difference. Okay, so we use motion vectors to compensate, and um, and so we'll get uh, a, a, a bit. Okay, it's not that visible, but it's a bit more compact. And the entropy now drops from 6.1 to 5.6 bits per pixel. So we got you know further refinement there. Right? And this is what it looks like. Um, so red line is the entropy per frame if you just apply JPEG every single frame. Here you've done that for the first frame, but then for the subsequent frames, uh, you encode the frame difference. And here you do the same, but this time you motion compensate uh, for, um, for that frame, okay? And you see, okay, so that, that seems to work. Uh, you know, using motion compensation, we get a better prediction for what the next frame should be, and because we have a better prediction, then it's easier for us to encode. It's a classic model, okay? So all what we've done so far is can we predict what the next pixel should be or what the next frame and so on, okay? And if you have a good model for what, you know, how to predict something, then you can encode, uh, you can compress that a bit better. <coughs> okay, so um, now something to keep in mind, okay? So. Now we use motion vectors, but we need to encode them. So, um, the, you know, you'd be like, okay, so that adds quite a bit of, of data. But because you work on a, a block level, um, the, the actual information you have to save is only two numbers per block, which is not too much. Uh, so, in effect, it's not a huge penalty on, on, your, on, your, on your compression. So, um, it is you know, you have a bit of an overhead to use motion vectors, but it's, it's worth it. And um, basically, all motion, uh, all, all video compression algorithms are based on these ideas, okay? So you would have uh, a bunch of keyframes, okay? They would be encoded using uh, JPEG, right? And these are called iframes, okay? They're called iframes for intracoded frames. So intracoded frames means that these are frames that don't require any other frames to be decoded, All right? So when you analyze uh, any stream, so VP9, H264, and so on, there will be a number of frames in the stream that says basically, I can decode this frame regardless of the future and the past. You know, just I give you the information in clear for that, um, for that frame. The reason why we have that, there's multiple reasons, but uh, one of them is um, that allows you, okay, if you want to skip, you know, you want to see the end of the movie and not the beginning, um, then it's a good idea to have a way of skipping there. So, you, you know, if you have to uh, just work by different from frame to frame, uh, then you have to uh, really read the movie from the start and decode. So, I know, if you have 10 minutes of movie, there will be 10,000 frames there. Uh, so, you have 10,000 frames to decode to get to the minute 10 of your movie, and that would be quite slow. So uh, typically, you would have you know, an iframe every, every few seconds of your movie, and um, you know you can skip to that frame. The, <clears throat> the interest of that iframe as well is means like if you have a degradation or if you lost a packet somewhere, or if you have, you know, I don't know, whatever accident happened, um, you don't lose the entirety of your movie, you still have a point where you can uh, restart from, from scratch. The, the system of encoding the difference, okay, is they're called prediction frames, okay, they're called p-frames. So i-frames for, um, a nicer for me to think about it is i-frame, usually we refer to a picture as i, so i-frame is really just encode a picture. And p-frame, it's for the predicted frames, okay? Um, so that would be the same. So in this case, we use JPEG to uh, compress the frame difference, okay? We use um, motion composited frame difference in that case. But the heart of it, every time you come back to pixels, you know, every time you have pixels, we just use uh, 
something similar to JPEG um, to, to, to encode, okay? All right, so, um, <coughs> this is a, a, a diagram, uh, how you could, a block diagram, how you could do that. <laughs> you lost already? <laughs> You're like, yeah, no, okay, it'd be fine. Um, it gets worse after. Yeah, you have that. <laughs> um, the, no, look, the, the idea is quite simple, okay? So I, I go through the whole stuff, okay? Um, so these are the kind of diagrams you have in the papers and so on. Anyway, you start from your current frame and uh, you're going to uh, measure, you're going to look at the current frame, apply motion estimation with the previous frame, okay? So there's the delay here, just to say, do the t motion estimation between two consecutive frames. You apply motion compensation and you do the difference, okay? So you just do what we talked about. And then you compute the DCT, uh, apply quantization, apply entropy coding, and, and you're fine, all right? That seems like a good idea. Um, um, but that's not, uh, and that's the, sorry, that's the decoded version, okay? So just do exactly um, the same, but, um, but you, you go in the other way. The problem if you do that is it's a terrible idea, okay? <clears throat> and and um, so the red line is um, if you encode JPEG at every single frame. Right? By the way, there is a name, there's a codec called Motion JPEG. And um, the name is very non-intuitive because it doesn't do anything with motion, okay? Actually applies JPEG at every single frame, right? So um, it's, it's a poor, I think it's a very poor name. But anyway, so that the standard one, and this is what happens to your uh, mean absolute error. So we're not looking at the entropy here, we're looking at the uh, mean absolute error uh, on, your, on your picture, okay? And um, so after, you know, you encode and you decode, okay? And, and it gets worse and worse, and you know, at the beginning it starts well, and then the error starts to, to accumulate. And, and the reason why, it degrades, okay? So <clears throat> this is motion JPEG, okay? So you take a, the tenth frame, and this is the simple encoder. And I don't know if you can see here, but you start to see a lot of JPEG artifacts here uh, due to the DCT and so on. And it makes sense because the, the problem is, um, <clears throat> okay, notations might not help here, but the problem you have is you, going back to the, to this diagram here, you compute the motion estimation between uh, clean images, okay? So the, the, the two clean images coming from your inputs. And you use that and then you apply the DCT on the difference and you quantize. So you basically look at the frame difference and you round that difference, okay? And by rounding the difference, uh, you make you know, a small error. But to decode frame number 10, you need to decode all the previous frames and you need to combine all these differences from frame zero to frame 10. So because you're going to combine, you're going to add all these differences, you're going to add all the errors you made. So the error is going to get bigger and bigger because at every single new frame, you're going to introduce a little, a little quantization error. So the quantization will just uh, increase uh, without any bounds. Does it make sense? We're trying to reconstruct frame 10 by looking at the difference, all the consecutive difference between two, um, all the differences between co two consecutive frames, okay? But each, if at each of the differences, you encode them and introduce an error to reconstruct frame 10, you accumulate all the errors you've made from frame one to frame 10. So this is, this is what you get. Um, so, <clears throat> so you need to do something slightly different, okay? Um, so, the idea here is like, uh, all right, the gist of it is you're going to say, well, instead of doing motion estimation between my current frame and the previous frame, what I will do is um, to measure the difference to, between um, the reconstructed previous frame, all right, 
and the current frame. So basically what you say here, okay, you have my current frame, I've, however I got that, I you know, have a frame difference, I encode that frame difference, that's fine. And then I'm going to uh, redecode it, okay, to see what results I get. Okay, so I'm at frame 10, I've encoded all the frames up to frame 9, and I'm going to look at what the results I have for frame 9 as a decoded frame. Okay, so I have the decoded frame 9, which is not perfect, but now what I can do is I can take the difference, I can say instead of trying to um, <clears throat> use uh, that frame, it, it, instead of trying to take the difference between the previous frame and the current frame, I could take the difference between the previously decoded frame, which is a, what the decoder has, and the current frame. Okay? In which case, you know you don't propagate error because if you propagate error, you can always encode the difference between the error you're making uh, at just last stage and the current frame. Have I lost everybody here? No? In the previous stage, we looked at the, the difference between two consecutive frames and then we encoded the difference. But now we're only going to encode the difference between something we know how to decode, so the decoded previous frame and the current frame. And therefore, if we know how to, pre to the error is always going to be bounded by the JPEG, um, the limitation of JPEGs. And this is what you get, okay? So you see the error here. Um, <clears throat> that's the first scenario where we combine the errors. When this scenario is with the purple line or the or, uh, pink line, uh, there is very, it's kind of bounded. You don't, um, you don't get too bad, okay? You just get as bad as just a JPEG difference between your expectations and what you get. All right? So it's called a feedback process, okay? Because you feed back the, your, your system, uh, your estimation um, back for the next stage. So on the left, the, uh, the JPEG artifacts you know, build up, and here you're, you never make an error. Uh, yes? Do you compensate the, uh, the decoded frame the motion? Can you go back to yeah. the diagram? Because from the diagram, it seems like you, you're compensating, you're using the motion you estimated to compensate the frame you decoded before using it compensates the motion, right? Because if you look at the, <coughs> the, yeah. of the motion compensator, it feeds back as well. So it's actually two feedback loops. It feed, feedbacks into the, the sum of the reconstructed DSD. Yeah, so you do the motion estimation between the reconstructed frame and the current frame. Then you, you use that in the, in the reconstructed frame. That's what I'm not understanding. See what I mean? It seems it's, it seems to me that you're that you're using the motion estimator um, I, I'm not understanding the feedback there's two, there's the there's motion there's estimator right. and the and your reconstructed frame. All right, so you have two options, okay? So either you, uh, you compute the motion estimation between your original frames. Okay, so that's option number one. So the motion is correct. Uh, or you say, the alternative is to say, well, the original frame is pointless because I never have, at the decode time, I never have access to that particular frame. Okay, I only have access to the decoded frame. So I'm better off computing the motion estimation between the decoded frame and the current original frame. So the idea of the feed, all the feedback loop you have is to say, I only, okay, what is the point of all that? Okay, I'm trying to predict what the next frame is based on what I have right now. If you use original frames, the problem is you assume you start from the original frame and you say, given this original frame, estimate the next original frame. 
But at decode time, you have never have access at any point to the, or the original frames. So you, the only thing you have access to is the last, latest decoded frame. The idea here is to say, let's use that frame as the reference frame and say, can I go from this frame, can I predict what the next original frame should be? And then you use, use that, and then you say, right, so I can do difference, I can do JPEG on that. So at any given time, you're only as worse as that particular. I understood that. So my question is, then why do you have this? Uh, so why doesn't the motion estimate the compensator also just go directly into the uh, the difference between the current frame and the motion estimation? Why does it also add to your compile your um, decoding frame? That's the only thing I'm not really saying. Are you talking this part here? Yeah. Exactly. All right, so let me, let me think th <laughs> through that. <laughs> um, so you, this is the density of the difference you had between uh, previous frame and so on. So when you have the inverse density, what you get here is not the inverse density of the frame itself, but the inverse density of the frame difference. So you need to add, that's your original reconstructed frame, previous frame, you need to add the difference um, according to your DCD. And what you get here is the reconstructed frame at the last stage, okay? So imagine here you're at, um, here you're at frame eight. So you have decoded frame eight. This is the decoded frame eight you have here. Um, and then you move on and you do the, uh, oh yeah, forgot about it. <laughs> so that, that's kind of the idea, okay? So you, you, you enjoy that now. <clears throat> okay, so, so let's look at this time the graph of entropy. So before we're looking at the error, okay? This is what the error you make over time. Um, of course, the error is indicative of how well you're going to be able to predict things, okay? Uh, this is uh, the entropy. And you can see, uh, so the uh, black one is a simple encoder, so you're, you're, you seem like you're doing very well. And it's true you're doing very well because the entropy, um, you're looking at the entropy between the original images, so actually you're doing better in terms of quantization. Uh, here you're doing slightly worse, and that's because, with the feedback, and that's because it's harder to predict because now you're working between a mix between your predicted image, which is noise uh, quantized, and the target image, which is the original image, which is a different nature, okay? So there's a, 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 a difference between the two pictures, okay? So your, your, the, the picture you have, the start form is now the, you're trying to look at the difference between uh, a clean input image and um, a, 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 a quantized, uh, image and therefore there is more to to add in the noise so therefore the entropy is slightly worse does it make sense okay so the cost of feedback is that now the difference at every single time the difference the error you have to match is a bit higher like you have more work to do to get back to where you want but the benefit is that the error doesn't um, doesn't accumulate this is the actual stuff you have in h261 um, and the point of all the previous graphs was to say, okay, now this is a bit more complex, but you can understand all the, all the blocks. And if you look in detail, that makes sense, but you get all that. You get all the motion compensation, the, the decoding, and so on. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so H261 um, was only, um, um, Including in, in form, so we we'll see this kind of stuff. Okay, so you see, um, as, right, IPPPP. So that means that your first frame is I intra coded frame, so JPEG, and then all the subsequent frames are predicted frames. Um, and then they're starting to introduce the fact you could loop, you know, you could have um, these chunks. So you can start with an I, and then you interleave with another I, and then so on. Okay, and uh, this is called uh, a group of pictures. Okay, so the, the period between frames is called the group of pictures. Um, so that's the, 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 <clears throat> the time you have between your, um, your different keyframes. Um, but as well, 
the, you look at the structure of it, okay, uh, it's the, uh, use the letters for the intra predicted to say how many, where the predicted frames, when the intra frames. They will become more obvious when we talk about B frames. Um, anyway, some of the notes. Um, the <coughs> we use blocks for motion estimation and we use blocks for DCT, okay? So a bit confusing here. So uh, typically we refer to the uh, blocks for motion estimation as macro blocks, okay? So macro block refers to motion estimation and blocks refers to, uh, to just DCT, okay? So remember, DCT, we use eight by eight blocks, and typically we use 16 by 16 for motion, but that can vary. There's different sizes of motion depending on, like the most uh, more recent um, um, encoders will have all sorts of different uh, sizes for that. Okay? So now comes the bi-directional production. Okay, so the idea here is like, so far, we just look at uh, time in a very sequential way. Um, but if you're a bit patient, you don't really have, if you not, don't have any real-time uh, requirements, uh, what you could do is trying to encode a few frames uh, ahead and trying to decode intelligent frames by putting information from both sides, okay? So this is the example. Um, you have two frames, so X and Z, and you have an in-between frame, and you could say, well, there are parts of the frame here uh, that I uh, could only get from this frame and other parts that I could predict from this frame, okay? So you say, if I can use multiple reference frames, I could do motion estimation between my current frame and you know, multiple frames, in this case, two frames. And if I can do that, then I'll get a better prediction for that, okay? So the way it works, um, so the way it works is you have two key frames, so let's say two I frames, so X and Z, and you look at Y, you can do motion estimation between Y and X, motion estimation between Y and Z, and for each block, you look at which prediction gives you the best DFD. Okay, so you look, let's say, if we're looking at this block here, uh, say the, the tree, um, if I try to find a, a good matching block in this image, that would be very hard because that part of the tree is occluded. Uh, so I can't find a block with a good DFD here, but I can find a block with a good DFD here, okay? So the idea, I run two motion estimations and I just at each block take a note of which one gives me the best vector, okay? So you just add one extra piece of information, one bit of information to tell you which vector I should, I, should, I should take. And this I called um, B frames, okay? So you end up with something like that, okay? So this is actually um, um, <clears throat> a, a very typical um, MPEG-2 uh, group of frames structure, okay? So you have, is it 12? I forgot, 12 or 15 um, uh, frames in between two iframes, okay? So you have this iframe, this iframe, and then, uh, so that tells you that you have a GOP of, um, I can't count, but it's say 12, okay? Maybe it's 15. Um, and, um, and then in between you have um, you know, interleaved of P frames and B frames, okay? So let's see, do we have an example of that? Ah. Let's see how that gets computed, okay? So you start from the iframe that you can decode, and you can decode this frame that's very easy for you as well because the, it's self-contained, right? And then what you do is you say, all right, so I have, I cannot compute this frame because it's a B frame and it requires information from the future, and this B frame um, will require this P frame to be, um, <clears throat> to be decoded, okay? So the order is first decode the iframes, and then look at the P frames. So the predicted frames, this blue one here, will be computed from the motion vector going from this I frame to this P frame, okay? So the P frame is like, in this case, every four frames, and the motion vectors will be between this frame four and this frame one. Does it make sense? You kind of ignore these two in-between frames, you just say, I know this frame, predict me 
this frame by using the scheme we talked about. Okay, so you compute the motion estimation between this frame and the the iframe, and then apply the difference and then encode that. Okay, so this one requires this one, and then you can compute this other one by having decoded this one. Okay, so the you look at the previously decoded p frame, and you look this is this one. So you encode the difference between these two p frames and, 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 and keep on going, okay? Then comes the in-between frames, so the b frames, bidirectional frames. And this bidirectional frame will require information from this previously computed i frame and the next frame available, which is this p frame, all right? And you do the same for the b frame here. This b frame will reuse information from the previous i frame and the next p frame. Does it make sense? So there's kind of an order in which you do things. You first start with your i frame, okay? So you have your i frames here, and then you compute sequentially your p frames. So you compute this one and this one, uh, uh, you know, and so on. And then you go back and you say, okay, this i and p frame sandwich two b frames, therefore I can compute them as well, okay? Um, by the way, this was the uh, interest of, um, sorry, just switch off the lights. Sorry, so I forgot these slides. Um, so you have four frames of the sequence on the top. Um, and this is the iframe um, you have. Um, and this is the, um, the error you have, if you want, on the p frame. So these are p frames encode the difference between frame two and frame one and so on. Um, and this is the b frame, the error you have on the b frame. And you can see, um, so, so, so what is it telling you? Okay, so here, if I have p frame, p frame, p frame, this is the difference between frame two and frame one. This is the difference between frame three and frame two, and this is the difference between frame four and frame three, okay? Um, with all the stuff we need to do with the motion composition and so on, okay? So the error is, you know, it's, 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 it's small, but, um, but kind of constant over time. In the IBBP uh, format, you start from the iframe, and then you jump directly to this guy, and this guy, you have to actually compute motion estimation between um, uh, frames that are actually four frames apart, okay? So the error is a bit bigger, okay? So there's a cost to do that. So you, you skip all the in-between steps. Therefore, now the difference between this frame one and frame four is actually quite, you know, it's a bit more pronounced. So therefore, the P frame you have has a bigger error. Therefore, you need more, um, more information to encode that. But the benefits is that the B frames that you obtain from, so you get this one from frame one and frame four. So this frame now has a very low error, okay? So you actually do very well on the B frame. So when you look back here, you get something like that, okay? So you have the entropy on the y-axis and you have the, uh, the frame number here on the x-axis. So you have motion JPEG, the baseline here, around 2.5. And then here you have an IPPPP, IPPPP um, uh, format. So you start from the encoding this first frame as I, and then all the subsequent frames are predicted uh, from the previous frame. And you can see the entropy um, is quite low and then starts again at your, at your I. If you do motion composited, you get better, and if you apply these bidirectional schemes, you kind of get this, um, this ups and downs, okay? And basically what happens, like these ones are your P frames that, are, that you're not very good at decoding, okay? At predicting because now you have a jump of four frames. So that's not very good, it's harder for you to decode. But if you look at your B frames, they're much lower than, uh, they're much better predicted, so you, you gain a lot, okay? So it's a trade-off, but overall, um, you're, you're, you're doing much better. Does it make sense? All right. So three types of encoding, 
iframes, which are the intracoded frames, which is JPEG. You have P frames, predicted frames, which are basically you look at the f uh, motion composited frame difference between two frames. And the B frames, which are predicted from both sides. Um, so you, you know, use a, a frame in the past and frame in the future to go in both ways and use motion estimation in both ways. Okay, so they're all interleaved in a structure, in a, in a pattern. The pattern is called group of picture structure. And group of picture is just the, 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 the time you have between iframes. And that is MPEG, okay? Uh, so we have, the last handouts will be on MPEG and to look at more details and how it's done. But basically, this is a structure of, you, know, you have 95% of understanding of modern um, uh, codecs. What I say modern codecs have in, in top of that is lots of subtleties about block sizes, block shapes, where you encode things and so on, and, and uh, transforms and details and so on. But in terms of the, the core ideas, uh, this is pretty much what you have, okay? So um, this, um, and I say like MPEG um, 2 has a structure like that really in place and you, you, know, you have motion vectors and you have all these things going on. All right, thank you very much.